All right, guys, now we're going to start talking a bit about the most important industry that emerged in the West, the railroad. And before 1860, all of our railroad lines basically ended at the Mississippi, with a few stretching into places like Kansas City and Omaha. But the U.S. government would give these subsidies, these huge pieces of land and money to the railroads to try and get them to build more of them. And towns would even offer money to railroads to build towards them in that direction. But there was still no way to get to San Francisco from New York without sailing uh, around the tip of South America. So this was going to be a huge deal. In 1862, President Lincoln signs into law the Pacific Railway Act. This the, proves the creation of a transcontinental railroad that would link the country together. You would have two companies would be contracted to build it. You would have the Union Pacific Railroad, which would be building west from Omaha, Nebraska. And you would have the Central Pacific Railroad, which would be building east from Sacramento and San Francisco. And they would meet up somewhere in the west. Eventually, it's going to be this place called Promontory Point, which I'll show you in just a little bit. In 1862, Congress gave charters to two companies to build it. The Central Pacific was to push eastward from Sacramento over the Sierra Nevada mountains. The Union Pacific was to start from the Missouri, cross the Great Plains, and cut through the Rockies. Both companies were to receive vast loans from the Treasury as they went along. $16,000 per mile of level track, $32,000 in the plateaus, and $48,000 in the mountains. Lobbyists got the rates doubled within a year. Leland Stanford, governor of California and president of the Central Pacific Railroad, persuaded a malleable geologist, Professor Josiah Whitney, to declare the gently sloping Sacramento Valley a mountainous region so that the Central Pacific could collect the highest possible rate for laying track across it. A grateful California legislature later named its highest peak Mount Whitney in the professor's honor. Congress also promised each company 6,400 acres of federal land for every mile of track it laid. The railroads got the right-of-way and along the right-of-way miles and miles of, of what was then the government's land. When you added it all together, it was uh, a gift of roughly the size of California plus most of Montana. How the railroad was given this money is that they were given also these huge pieces of land, 10 square miles on either side of the track in a checkerboard pattern to use as they will. And what ends up happening is the railroad is now able to not only have the right-of-way, control of the direction of the, of the railroad, but also all of this extra land that they can then sell to farmers. In Nebraska, some 10,000 men were at work on the Union Pacific, heading west. Most were immigrants from Ireland, but there were also Mexicans and Germans, Englishmen, ex-soldiers and former slaves, an army of workmen moving across the plains with military precision. There was no time for rest. A 20-car work train housed and fed the men who rose at dawn. A supply train carried everything needed that day. Rails, ties, spikes, rods. All of which had to be loaded onto flat cars and run up to the railhead where the iron men were already waiting. Each rail weighed 700 pounds. It took five men to lift it into place. Two or three miles a day, every day. Six days a week, week in and week out. While the Union Pacific moved west again across the Great Plains, in California, the Central Pacific, after a fast start, had gotten stuck in the Sierra Nevadas. The mountains seemed impenetrable. And to make matters worse, Charles Crocker, whose job it was to break through them, could not seem to hold on to his workers. Three out of five stuck with him just long enough to get a free ride to the railhead then set out on their own for the Nevada gold fields. His plans called for a workforce of 5,000. He had fewer than 600. 
Desperate, he suggested to his superintendent of construction, James Strobridge, that he try the Chinese, who were eking out a living working the gold and silver tailings abandoned by others. Strobridge was against it. He thought the Chinese were too small, too frail. They had no experience building railroads. Crocker told Strobridge to give the Chinese a chance. After all, he said, they had built the Great Wall of China. Before long, 11,000 Chinese were at work on the Central Pacific, and Crocker was advertising for more in China. But hard work alone was no match for the Sierra Nevadas. Strobridge worried that his Central Pacific was falling even further behind in their race with the Union Pacific. And soon armed the Chinese with black powder to blast their way through. It took 500 kegs of it a day, week after week, to carve cuts through the foothills. And then they came up against a face they called Cape Horn, solid rock nearly straight up and down, 2,000 feet above a raging river. There were no footholds, but the Chinese were told to make a ledge in the cliff, wide enough for a train. My grandfather was one of the people that they put in the baskets because he was small and light. And what they did was... Uh, that they would be lowered over cliffs and they would drill holes and then they'd set the dynamite in them and then they'd light the dynamite and then they'd pull them up uh, uh, by these uh, by the baskets and then they had to get out of there before the dynamite exploded Charles Crocker had to punch the line through the Sierras that winter, the winter of 66. And the Chinese then had to build the railroad, lay the tracks. So they built these tunnels under the snow to keep advancing the line. And sometimes there would be snow slides. An entire crews of Chinese would be trapped under tons of snow. And their bodies would be left there and found the following spring. Sometimes the bodies were found with the picks and the shovels still in their hands. The problem was that this was a heavily scandalized building because the Credit Mobilier Company who built the railroad bribed congressmen with stock in Credit Mobilier to continue funding the building of the railroad. And the men would get rich whether the railroad worked or not. And the worst part about it was the guys who ran the Union Pacific were the same men who ran the Credit Mobilier Company. And so it was a massively scandalous deal that affected President Grant's administration. But in 1869, the two tracks did meet up at Promontory Point in Utah, drove the Golden Spike home, and for the first time, our country was united east to west. Travel from New York to San Francisco now only took a week. More towns were built. More people could now move to the west. Gold and silver from the west could reach the markets in the east. The territories became states much more quickly. And it divided the country. For the first time, we've divided the country into four time zones. So we united it physically, but now we can keep accurate track of time because if you're going to run a railroad, you're going to have to have it on a solid schedule. This was the internet of its day. Thanks, guys, for paying attention. Hopefully we took good notes. <laughs>